Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Okay, the truth. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a bit of a problem with the sensors lately. Okay, we're going to talk about um, digestion, but not real, like, like because we talk about how digestion, we do a lot of videos on that, because you're only alive because you're able to take proteins, get the amino acids, fatty acids from the fats, and usable sugars from the carbohydrates. But we're going to talk more about the mechanical action at what you can do. We're going to talk about hiatal hernias. We're going to talk about diaphragmatic breathing, the lymph flow. I mean, everything that you can actually do. Now, on the censored portion, we're going to talk about when the panic ends, okay, and, and what that's going to be like. Now, we just lost another video through the censors, and this, I, I, I mean, if you've seen my videos in the past, you know, the deleted ones, okay, the title of the video was Healthy Brain Function, Toxicity is in the Blood-Brain Barrier. Do you know anything that crosses the blood-brain barrier that we can't talk about today? Okay. I know. I can't say it either. <laughs> it's, it's like, of course, that ain't going to be on there. But for everybody that support the Dr. B VIP, God bless you. Thank you very much. Um, what, that, that support goes a long way. And, and you're going to be watching this uninterrupted. This past, past weekend, we did a, over a two-hour webinar for Extreme Health Academy. We're going to be doing more and more webinars. I do at least one a month, but it is phenomenal. If you've had chronic health issues in any type of area, there's forums, there's, there's I mean, these people in, in the library that we have there is out of this world. We're also on Library, BitChute, Odyssey, Rumble, um, you know, just trying to, you know, circle the wagons. So when everything shuts down. Now, digestion. Digestion begins when you smell stuff, okay? Your brain recognizes that, and it produces a certain stomach acid based on what, you, what you're going to consume. And Pavlov, if you ever remember Pavlov's dog, you know, he'd ring a bell and feed a dog. They would cut holes in the stomach. So if a dog smelled chicken, it would produce a certain acid. Lamb, totally different acid. Broccoli, totally different acid. So the brain is involved in digestion. Now, you're only going to get three things, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Now, the protein digestion and everything starts to begin in the mouth because you got to chew it up. This is why they say you got to masticate or break up the food so you can get it down. Because anything that you can't break down, and your whole body is designed to break the proteins to amino acids, fats to fatty acids, and carbohydrates to usable sugars. Now, the nervous system controls this. Now, you have the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve um, is, goes on the front and back of the esophagus going down, down from the brain. And it does everything in the digestive tract. It does, does the motility, does the excretions. I mean, everything, everything. That's 10% of its function. 90% of this nerve's function is sensory. So does that mean that everything that you take in your system is so vitally important that there's cultures out there that would prey over the food because that food becomes them. I know, wow, huh? Yeah, we're going to go back to that, okay? Now, the nervous system, one part keeps you alive under stress. So if you're in a stress state, you're not going to have that rest, digest, and repair system going. So we're going to talk about breathing techniques and other techniques to allow your parasympathetic to work, to work correctly. Stomach is amazing. It produces enough acid where it can burn a hole in, in carpet or wood. It can dissolve a nail. And so you might say, how come it doesn't dissolve itself? You know, that's what Pavlov did. So he thought, how come it doesn't dissolve itself? The key thing is the stomach actually does dissolve itself. I mean, you've got this mucus layer that's always being secreted. Okay, and that protects the stomach lining, but the body breaks that mucus down. And you've got chief cells that produce the pepsin. You've got these, uh, these parietal cells that produce hydrochloric acid. Now, you might say, you know, how can a, a cell produce hydrochloric acid? What's the friggin' thing made of, right? Okay, yeah. One part's got a chlorine uh, atom. One part's got a hydrogen. And the hydrochloric acid forms outside of the cell. 
I know it's amazing. It was just dumb luck. You know, I know you're talking about intelligent design. No, no, no. That just was, you know, dumb luck. No, there's an intelligent design, okay? This is to every doctor out there, okay? Just think that the body is intelligent and its responses are intelligent. Then you're not going to drug blood pressure issues. So let's look at how important breathing is to digestion. This right here, the muscle going across, is the diaphragm. Then you've got the esophagus coming out of it, and right underneath that diaphragm is the stomach. And, and so this right here, that diaphragm, is innervated by nerves in the neck. And so when you breathe in, the diaphragm comes down. You breathe out, the diaphragm goes up. So this is always moving that organ tissue. And you can see there's a bunch of connections for that stomach going up. And you could even see there's a discoloration there because the, the tissue inside of the esophagus is totally different than the tissue in the stomach. That's why you want to keep the acid in the stomach. Now, at the bottom of this, there's a muscle at the bottom of the esophagus um, and the top of the stomach, and it's at the lower end of the esophagus. So you know what they're going to call it? Lower esophageal sphincter. I know. I know, that's why I was so good at anatomy, because it was like so freaking basic, okay? It's what it does or where it is, you know? It's pretty much it. So that lower esophageal sphincter has got to tighten up in order to keep the acid inside of the stomach. Now, you can see there with the stomach right next to that, that diaphragm, if the diaphragm gets loose, so let's say that you've got a problem with the neck, okay? C3, C4, C5 is where the nerve to the diaphragm comes out. That can weaken that tone of the diaphragm. Or let's say you're sedentary lifestyle. You're only going to be breathing where you're using the top third of your lungs instead of where the tummy is going in and out like a bellows. That's when you're using the bottom two thirds of the lungs. Now, um, it, it's, it's odd that people, because you know, you've know you heard of people with asthma, right? Okay, raise your hand if you knew someone in your class that had asthma. Okay, two people, not a lot of old people in your class when you're in school, not, not the, the yeah, teaching class. Okay, that's unusual because now it's 25%. So if you got 40 people in there, you're looking at 10 of them at least have asthma. Okay, I can't remember one person in our school. Okay, but now it's getting more and more. But knowing that the nerve that supplies the breathing muscle, wouldn't you kind of look at the neck? I would think so. So the mnemonic is C3, C4, C5 keeps you alive. Now, we're going to talk about diaphragmatic breathing and how it relates to digestion. So think of this. When you're breathing, the diaphragm comes down, the tummy has got to come out. You blow out, the diaphragm comes in, the tummy goes up. So that movement, that actual movement of the diaphragm is vitally important. You're massaging the organs, you're moving the lymph, you're helping with digestion. It's hugely important. Now, it's interesting. A lot of studies on diaphragmatic breathing. Now, why would diaphragmatic breathing lower blood pressure? Well, let's say we put a plastic bag over your head and don't allow oxygen in. You're right. You'd suffocate. Okay, we'll just do a small one right here. Okay, okay. So that's going to limit oxygen transfer. So that means that the carbon dioxide levels are going to go up in your blood. So that means the heart rate goes up. So now if you can transfer that carbon dioxide to oxygen quicker, that, work, that makes more sense. Yes? Okay, good. So when you breathe like this, where the tummy comes in and your chest goes up, you're using the bottom top part of the lungs, which is not that big. You breathe like this, where the tummy comes out and goes back in, you're using the bottom two-thirds of the lungs. And the way you practice diaphragmatic breathing is put your, tummy on, your hands on your tummy, and on three, you're going to blow out. One, two, three, blow out. And you push it in. Then when you breathe in, Push your tummy out. Blow out and push in. Breathe in and push out. Blow out and push in. Okay, so this is diaphragmatic breathing. Now, if you've just done this, okay, yeah, and if you, if you have a friend close to you, you can help them out. <laughs> no, nicely. <laughs> but that, that is a way to learn it. But look at this. Decreased muscle tension, increased oxygen. That little three-pound brain burns 90% of the body's oxygen, so it improves concentration, strengthens the immune system, allows the hormones. I mean, this is an exercise we give to quadriplegics. 
We give to paraplegics. And this is an exercise that you can do when you're laying in bed, okay, just getting ready to go to sleep. Because you know how your brains are bouncing around and you're thinking, okay, Ukraine, the this, the food shortage, the gas shortage, okay, you know, more restrictions, you know, and, and you're, and you're going to go to sleep like that? Okay, no, diaphragmatic breathe. Do 10 diaphragmatic breaths. <sighs> nice, slow. You exhale twice as long as you breathe in. Do 10 of those, I'm telling you, you'll be asleep by the ninth breath. Now, effectiveness of diaphragmatic breathing for reduction of psychological and, and physiological stress in adults. Um, brilliant, that in multiple, multiple studies. And I love this. The, given the benefits of diaphragmatic breathing on stress reduction, because remember digestion? You got sympathetic or fight or flight. You get the rest, digest, and repair. If you can stimulate that rest, digest, and repair, wait a second, that would be repair for every cell in your body. This means that your body can actually start regenerating tissue. Ongoing research is needed to establish the evidence base for this self-administered, low-cost, non-pharmacological intervention. Yeah, I could see that happening. A lot of pharmaceuticals are going to invest in teaching you how to breathe and the <laughs> benefits behind it. You know, they could, you could save a lot of money on your, on your drug copay. Now, when you're breathing, you want to breathe in through the nose, and you can breathe out through the nose. Okay, I know, everyone's worried about boogers. Okay, in through the nose, out through the mouth is also okay. But if you breathe in through the nose and out through the nose, you're going to desensitize the mucous membranes. And when you breathe in through the nose, you're creating nitric oxide. And so this opens up the air tubes in the lungs, called a bronchodilator, and it opens up the blood vessels, that's a vasodilator. You, what I teach when we talk about blood pressure, we talk about everything, I say, look, uh, deep breathe 10 minutes diaphragmatically and then check your blood pressure with your arm level. So when you look at this, this is a neck. I mean, obviously she's trying to get the curve back in the neck, but she still has a reverse curve. That curve is supposed to curve in the front. C3, C4, C5 keeps you alive. Do you think she might have a diaphragmatic problem of urban innervation? Absolutely. And plus, look at the thoracic area. Do you see, is that straight up and down or is it bent off to the side? And this is super, super common. Now that diaphragm inserts or attaches at the bottom of the rib cage. And you can see that rib cage is not in good shape. It's not lined up or curved. So that's gonna be an issue. And so now I'm gonna show you how to fix the hiatal hernia. For one, you gotta look at the nerves and the insertion to make sure that diaphragm's functioning correctly. The other one, you got to have the left fist. Okay, if it's hard to remember, think of which way our government's going. Okay, left <laughs> fist. <laughs> okay, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Okay, put it under the left rib cage. Okay, kind of like like mid 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 area. Okay, now what you're going to do, and this is going to pull it down. You're going to breathe in. When you breathe out, you push in, turn the fist so you get the soft tissue out of the way, and pull it down. So you breathe in. Blow out, push in and pull down. So you're on the left side, you're not in the middle. The other side's left. <laughs> breathe, breathe in, blow out, push in and pull down. And you're literally pulling down the soft tissue. Figure that soft tissue moves a lot every time you breathe anyway. So this is super, super helpful. It's right underneath the rib. You push in and pull it down. And you do that three or four times. But when you're going to your chiropractor, they're going to be able to help you. They'll actually do it when you're on your back and your legs are bent. They'll pull it down. But they're going to also adjust the neck and adjust the diaphragm insertion. So they're going to really fix the problem. Now, what tightens up the lower esophageal sphincter to keep acid inside of that stomach? It's presence of acid. I know. It seems like too basic. So if you <laughs> dilute the acid in that stomach, the sensors can't tell to tighten up that muscle. So this is why you don't want to drink water a half hour before a meal, no water during a meal, and no water a half hour after. Acidic beverages could be okay, but just do little bits because you want, you want to get as much nutrient value from that food as possible, particularly with food shortages coming up. Okay, you know, you don't want to be, you know, having to take in a lot of nutrients. You want to break down everything that you have. So no water a half hour before a meal, no water during a meal, and no water a half hour after. Acidic beverages, maybe little sips of wine or coffee or tea or, or kombucha or something, that, that would be okay.
but your salivary glands are going to produce a lot. So if you're chewing a lot, you're going to have, have a good amount. And that's going to break it down. Now, so what did I just say? That reflux, that, that acid coming up, was it from too much acid or too little? It's too little acid because that acid isn't strong enough to stimulate the sensors to tighten it up. But now let's go to the pharmaceutical world. They're going to say it's too much acid. And they're going to give you a drug to decrease the stomach producing that acid. Now, granted, it's kind of a bummer because, you know, that's going to open up that lower esophageal sphincter. You won't feel bad. In fact, you'll feel a little better, but it's going to do damage to the esophagus. So what does that cause? Adenocarcinomas. And you might say, well, wait a second, that's throat cancers. Isn't this proton pump inhibitor supposed to protect me? No, it actually causes it. Um, because it's going to allow it to come up. Plus, when you're decreasing the acid with a pill, you need acid in order to absorb minerals. Without minerals, you can't absorb um, the, without acid, you can't absorb the minerals, and without minerals, you can't utilize vitamins. So this is a pathway to hell. So if you're taking a proton pump inhibitor, or an antacid, or Tums, and, or Rolades, okay? And I mean, I remember the commercials about 20 years ago. Luckily, they took them off. But what's healthier, Tums with, with, or Rolades with aluminum salt or Tums with calcium? Except Tums, when you would take it, you become calcium deficient because it decreases the acid so you can't absorb it. It's just, it was just advertising complete psychosis. But what happens when you reduce your acid, which means you reduce your minerals? Muscle spasms, of course. Irregular heartbeat, convulsions, seizures, cognitive decline. God, do we have a problem with that? Um, yeah. Okay, now, so right next to the stomach is this C-shaped thing called the duodenum. Now, the duodenum's totally cool. You've got the gallbladder and the pancreas draining through the same hole. It's called the ampulla vater. I used to tell the students the amphitheater of vater. So everything goes in there. But you can also see uh, they can be a secondary hole, but that gallbladder stores and concentrates bile. Its whole job in bile breaks down and emulsifies the fat. So as soon as fats hit that area right beyond the stomach, that gallbladder contracts and emulsifies the fats and breaks it down. It's just amazing. So then you get the fatty acids, you can produce hormones, you get great hair, you know, you get great skin, you get, get good cognitive function. So let's say that you're under stress and there's only three, physical, chemical, emotional, okay? And that's going to cause your body to produce stress hormones. The stress hormones go around. They do what they're supposed to do in the, in the body. Then they're funneled by the spleen over to the liver to make the bile, to break it down so nothing's wasted. But they can store and concentrate. The more stress you're under, the more gallstones or gallbladder sludge is formed. So this is literally where gallstones come from. They come from concentrated stress hormones. If you ever see them, they're super, super light. You could slice them, slice them open, and the crystal formations are similar to epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, you know, all the, all the stuff that, that you secrete under stress. So now, if some uh, barbarian removes the gallbladder, okay, because it's not an extra part, your body is still going to produce those bile, the, the bile acid, and it's going to slowly drip into that duodenum with no fats in there. And that's where duodenal ulcers, a big contributing factor, is after a gallbladder has been removed. So if a barbarian's going to remove a gallbladder because they just don't know the function of it, okay, or they don't know the secondary cause of it, or they don't know how to correct the stones um, that are in there, um, you've got to have fats, a lot of fats, because it's going to be hard for you to break it down, but you need those bile salts to have something to, to, to break up instead of the breaking up the duodenum. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, bacteria. I know we're supposed to be afraid of everything. Um, complete morons are saying, wash everything, be afraid of everyone, don't breathe on anyone because you're afraid of bacteria. Without bacteria and viruses, we all die. We're a symbiote. You've got thousands and thousands of bacteria all over your skin. <laughs> yeah, I'm messing with you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you've got bacteria in your eyes, on your eyelashes, in your hair, in your skin, everywhere. Without this, you die. Okay, it's that simple. You have 70 trillion cells, you got 100 trillion bacteria, you got four times that number in viruses. 
and you've got some bacteria that eat up yeast and candida and they keep you in, in balance. So like if you've ever heard of candida, it's candida overgrowth. No, you need candida. Parasites, not parasite, it's parasitic overgrowth. So you need a balance of this. This is why Aboriginal cultures had 30,000 different types of bacteria. But in our sterile psychotic environment where you're using Purell to wash everything, okay, we're, we're losing it. Okay, and because remember, the pharmaceutical industry that runs our government and, and media industry isn't going to tell you, wow, you need healthy bacteria in your system. You know, you need fresh air and to run around. Now, so what kind of things disrupt your microflora? You'll see the disinformation board got a hold of my slides. Disinformation governance board, because the things that, va that, that damage it are antibiotics, medications, and processed foods. Okay, so we can go into some of the three of the four, but not the fourth. Okay, so what kind of medications damage your gut flora? High blood pressure. Does anybody have high blood pressure or is it high stress? And, and just think of it, because if you actually think that high blood pressure is a disease, a silent killer that's attacking you, um, did you check the blood pressure in your dog or your cat? Or your fish? No, you're going to say no. Why? Because they regulate themselves. You're right. Only humans are too stupid to regulate their own physiology. Okay, you see how dumb that is? Okay, your body is going to adjust its blood pressure. If you're dehydrated, it's going to go up. If you're hydrated, it's going to go down. If you have poor sleep patterns, it's going to go up. If you have good sleep patterns, it's going to go down. If your blood is healthy, holding oxygen because you've got a good diet, it's going to be down. Okay, so the blood pressure is there because of physical, chemical, or emotional stress. And when we do a blood test, you see those beautiful, red, healthy blood cells floating around separate, gorgeous. Okay, blood pressure, your blood's beautiful. But if you're under stress, they lose their electronegative charge and they start to clump together. Then they have less surface area. So blood pressure, high blood pressure, is an adaptation to blood that's not efficient. Now, in a crazy world, you get inefficient blood, elevations in blood pressure, decreased oxygen flowing through the system, and a guy will check you and say, wow, you have high blood pressure. Here's a pill to lower it. Does that help ox? Wait, let me say this so, so people who are taking blood pressure pills don't understand it. A blood pressure drug that lowers blood pressure, does that help oxygen to the brain or slow it down? You know what I've had people say? I'm not a doctor. <laughs> dude okay yes okay so and it's really simple that's why we talk about diaphragmatic breathing diaphragmatic breathe 10 minutes before you check it with your arm level check it call up the doctor and said yeah you've taken up a new exercise and your blood pressure is getting too low and you don't talk it out okay anxiety medications antibiotics antidepressants pain relievers non steroidal anti-inflammatories these all destroy the gut flora and this is 80% of your immune system. This is keeping you alive. But we're in a culture that, that, that the, the people in health authority are pharmaceutically trained. You do not get normal advice from these people. High blood pressure. Is high blood pressure a disease or an adaptation to stress? Yeah, if you think it's a disease, what shape is it outside of the body? How much does it weigh? If not, I'm going to cup up to you, I'm going to stand on your foot, elevate your blood pressure, and you tell me that that's a disease. Okay? No, you're going to tell me to get off your foot. Okay, so we have a person here on the left with stress. He has been diagnosed with high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. Both of those are stress responses. That's him next to him without the, the stress and without the high blood pressure. I mean, it's very simple. Cholesterol-lowering drugs. If a doctor is going to give you a cholesterol-lowering drug, okay, say, what's the function of cholesterol? If he says he cl it clogs arteries, really, doc, show me the evidence, because it doesn't. Cholesterol is 50% of your weight in the brain. It's, it's used the precursor to almost every hormone your body makes. It's the most complicated molecule out there. And if you take a drug to lower it, not only does it increase hardening of the arteries, atherosclerotic placking, heart failure, and it damages the gut flora. Now, ulcers, where do ulcers come from? Now, some people will say this cool bug up there called helicopylorus, 
and it was brilliant. I mean, they used to think that, that bacteria couldn't live in the acid of the stomach, and then they found it, okay? And now they're finding out, well, wait a second, we got a problem, because it can't be this bug, because it's, it's in over half the world's population, and it doesn't really cause a problem in about 75 to 80% of them. And so, so what is it? Now, non anti-inflammatories, that can cause peptic ulcers. That's the Advil, the Motrin, the Aleve. Okay, when we look at this, it's found in half the world's population. About 70% of everybody is asymptomatic. The risk of infected people develop an infected ulcer in their lifetime from this bacteria is 10 to 15%. Read that backwards. If you have this drug, you have an 85 to 90% chance of not developing a peptic ulcer. Okay, read the other part. Okay, because this is American College of Gastroenterology. Developing gastric cancer is less than 3%. That means if you have this bug, you have a greater than 97% chance of not getting cancer in the gastric area. Okay, I'm just trying to, to, to show how I read journal articles. Okay, because it's like, <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> okay, so this bug doesn't cause a problem. Okay, non anti-inflammatory drugs. And in this thing, um, increases peptic ulcers more common in older adults. Why? Because you guys, you, you were, were raised in a very restrictive scholastic environment where you followed the rules. Okay, you had to follow the rules to your parents, otherwise they would kick you out of the house. Okay, and if you don't follow the rules in the school, you're not going to be successful in life and your dad would beat you up or something. Okay, so if the doctor tells you to take this pill, you end up taking it. Now, the stomach has three areas that protect it. The mucus from the goblet cells, the bicarbonate that neutralizes stomach acid, and the blood circulating to help that, that repair. non anti-inflammatories inhibit hinder all of these protective mechanisms. That's crazy. And then when you look at what the Advil, Motrin, and Aleve do, it destroys the building block of cartilage. And why do people take it for maybe like, you know, decreasing their joint pain? Okay, yeah, this will help your joint pain, but by God, it's going to destroy your joints, can cause stomach ulcers, can cause peptic ulcers, can increase heart attack risk. It's really bad. Increase acid versus decrease music or mucus. We know that the stomach layer, the mucus layer, protects it. When you're in a stressed state, you alter the function that decreases the goblet cell protection. So, I mean, it's, it's absolute obvious. Um, antibiotics, absolutely horrible for you. They could be life-saving if you have a bacterial infection that's going to kill you. Okay, but if you're taking it for a common cold or prophylactically, they're generally poisonous molds that can actually, every time you take an antibiotic, you're increasing your risk of abnormal cell growth. But it, if you kill the bacteria, so if you kill the bacteria that keep you alive, it allows yeast to grow. And the yeast can bore holes in the intestinal tract uh, called a leaky gut. And there's, there's, we're talking neurologic damage, a bunch of that. Now, New England Journal of Medicine about 10 years ago, azithromycin. Okay, anybody at ZPAC, anyone? Okay, is that the Ryerson? Okay, that's real popular now. Increases your chance of dying from a cardiovascular event like by whopping 250% within the first five days of usage compared to amoxicillin. It is nearly the same as Vax, which killed 60,000 people. So strengthening your immune system is a good idea. Not giving a poisonous mold that can damage your gut flora, your bacteria that keep you alive. Uh, increased intestinal permeability and Parkinson's disease. So think of this, you damaging the gut. There's, it's called the gut-brain connection, the enteric brain. Okay, if you damage this, you're damaging the neurotransmitters the brain uses. Does that mean that there could be a problem that you may have to get some movement to generate dopamine? Yes or yes? Yeah. Lou Gehrig's disease. Again, same thing. Circulating endotoxin, systemic immune system, sporadic. Um, when you're looking at this, um, the data suggests that um, uh, uh, lipopolysaccharides levels 
an activated monocyte macrophage may play significant roles in the pathogenesis of this. Again, we're looking at gut brain, we're looking at immune system response. Uh, Asia, and autoimmune inflammatory syndrome induced by adjuvants. Adjuvants are something that they put in an injectable um, medical uh, procedure that we can't talk about, but it's designed to stimulate the immune system and it can stimulate it in a negative way. So if you're con um, ever heard of silicosis, go four syndrome, um, macrophagic uh, myofasciitis syndrome, and post-vaccination phenomenon, this is actually what it looks like. The picture on the left, the big black area on the left hand, or the, the right hand side of that picture, that's a leaky gut. Okay, I mean, literally the intestinal tract is expanded. The one next to that is a normal bowel, and that's the same person about 90 days afterwards. So the gut can heal very, very quickly, but you have to identify the problem. You look at a normal gut, or x-ray of a, a child on the left, we're looking at a leaky gut on the right. And when people say, how can you tell that the person has a leaky gut? That's how you can tell. I mean, it's, it's literally expanding the intestinal tract because you figure the large intestine should be about the size of a stool that comes out. Okay, and if it's expanded to four or five times that, that means you got compromised nerve supply or abnormal um, flora in there that's expanding and creating gas or something, there's a problem. But you're looking at this, the gut-brain connection, behavioral bowel, behavioral, behavioral bowel disorders. This is hugely important. This is where neurotransmitters are, and this is why, you know, 54% of our kids um, have challenges. One of the, um, one of the products out there that's in our air, in our water, in our soil, and in our food, because it's generally recognized as safe, that's the grass certification, is the glyphosates. I mean, I just came, we did a conference in North Dakota, which is beautiful, great people, fantastic, I loved it. But my gosh, they're spraying glyphosates everywhere. I don't know what the, the bowel cancers in North Dakota are like, but it's got to be through the roof. I mean, it's crazy. Now, now, knowing that it increases intestinal permeability, causes a gut imbalance, um, it, it's mineral chelator, an an, natural antibiotic, damage to the intestinal wall, and that's 80% of the immune system. So this is something that should not be in our environment. And when I'm talking to the guys in North Dakota, they say there's no plan B. I say, look, monocrops destroy, are, are, are dangerous because you're drawing everything out of the soil. You're not allowing the soil to regenerate and you're using chemical fertilizers, and now we're seeing the chemistry is going through the roof because we get most of the chemicals from, from petroleum. There's, it's, it's, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, glyphosate damages the gut. The gut. Um, uh, celiac disease, gut imbalances, it can be fully explained by the known effects of glyphosate on gut bacteria. Uh, the glyphosates, um, mineral chelator, decrease magnesium, iron, cobalt, molybdenum, I mean, it's, it's nuts. And this, when I saw this article, I thought, my God, this is incredible. This is out of the British Medical Journal. Now, I'm glad you're sitting down, okay? Food is medicine. Actions to integrate food and nutrition into healthcare. Now, we actually had a patient who had her colon removed, about three foot of the colon, from colon cancer in the 1990s. And the oncologist said, ah, food doesn't have anything to do with this. There's still oncologists saying that today. And, and Hippocrates, thousands of years ago, said, let food be your medicine, medicine be your food. In the face of the global epidemic of diet-related chronic disease, there's an increased experimentation, increased experimentation with the use of food as medicine, interventions to prevent and manage and treat illness. This is amazing. There was a disease that was wiping out more people than guns, bombs, and explosions in the 14, 15, 1600s. It was called scurvy. Okay, it would wipe out a huge number of the crew. It turned out that it was diet related. <laughs> I mean, it's like, so this isn't a new concept. Okay, this is, this is like basic common sense but they're having such a problem integrating it 
with a pharmaceutically controlled group because because I mean if if you're trained symptom drug symptom drug symptom drug and now they're saying no give an organic healthy plant based diet give juicing and blending to people who have bowel disorders this way they can get their nutrients give vitamin C for for joint pain and omega threes or antioxidants and or phytonutrients in order to allow the inflammatory process to go that would wipe out the Advil market or a non steroidal anti inflammatory market. You would be wiping out a lot of these issues. An anxiety, stress, depression, you increase omega 3s, you help the gut flora. There's so many nutrient things that you do because disease doesn't really exist. Disease is an adaptation from deficiency and toxicity. Okay? And if you're deficient and toxic in something, you're not going to get healthy by taking another toxin. Okay, and look at every medication you take. Does it make you healthier? Okay, and if you're curious about this, this is what I'll tell everybody. Okay, so you're taking four or five medications. Okay, right now, you're on those four or five medications. You, you just asked me how to get off of them. I said, okay, right now we're moving to a deserted island. You have no access to pharmaceuticals. You only have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh fish, fresh water to eat. You have no access to pharmaceuticals, and that's your diet. Do you, does your health improve or decline? Guess what? 100% of people say, improve. <laughs> we know that this is stupid, but we're caught in a cycle like the North Dakota farmers. Okay? You, you're barely making ends meet. You can't, let, you can't change the crop because your government subsidies are forcing you to keep destroying your land and everything. So you're, you're caught in this cycle of hell. So you have to understand, and this is just a couple of years ago, the British Medical Journal is saying, look, we don't know how to train the doctors because they're paid per drug. They're not paid per advice. This is how you fix your body. You got to get a healthy nerve supply. So, and when people say, what's the best diet? The best diet is the way your great, great grandparents ate. Okay. I used to say grandparents, and then I got older, then I realized it's great-grandparents, then I got older, then it's great-great-grandparents, because <laughs> I'm seeing babies having babies now, so <laughs> their great-grandparents are the same age as me, so it's like, holy moly, <laughs> my, my baloney had two names, Oscar Meyer. Okay, so, so we got to go great-great-grandparents, okay? Organic, seasonal, plant-based. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, single mom, four kids. You had meat one day a week, and it was Sunday, and it was the big chicken or something. And then, you know, you had, you know, it was, it was soup. Um, actually, it was pasta on Monday with the chicken. And then it was chicken soup by Wednesday. <laughs> Am I the only one that was raised in the house like that? Okay, I'm telling you, the left, that flavor got better every freaking day. Okay, it was really good. Okay, so healthy nerve supply. If you're taking medications, Find a doctor that understands what those things do. Understand that your body is intelligent and either fire the doctor that's drugging you or find a doctor that understands that your body is adapting to a physical, chemical, or emotional stress. Healthy saturated fats, vitamin D3, leucosiodine, plant-based minerals, vitamin C, probiotics. I mean, just basic stuff. When you're looking at this, bowel disorders, inflammatory bowel disorders, celiac disease, gastrointestinal infections, diarrhea, illness, all of these things demonstrate that probiotic bacteria have beneficial effects. Why? You're introducing the bacteria. And this isn't just like, okay, you know, I have kombucha. No, get kombucha, kimchi, I mean, everything. Make your own fermented stuff. You need 30,000 different bacteria in there. This is just organizing the nutrients that go in your system. Just basic common sense probiotics, juicing, blending, because that, that, that builds your flora. You can eat grains, okay? Human beings have been consuming grains for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, okay? But the toxic grains that are now soaked with glyphosates are dangerous. Once you heal the gut, and that takes 30 to 45 days because you're dealing effectively with the physical, chemical, and emotional stress, sprouted grains, sourdough, um, amaranth, oats, all of these things are easily tolerated. tolerated. Um, this, man, I just want to dive in that bowl of blueberries there. But, you know, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. Hippocrates was right. 
Look at the blue zones, people that consistently live over a hundred. Okay. They, I mean, they, they, they have been eating this way for forever. This is how we grew up. Okay. Nobody would recognize, you know, Chick-fil-A. You know, what is that? You know, it, it, watch the video, the, 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 the Meet the Natives. It's a few years ago, but man, you had these natives from Papua New Guinea that were so much smarter than the people that they were interviewing. I mean, they went to a, a cattle ranch and they saw him injecting all of these drugs in the cattle and they said, aren't you guys afraid that you're going to be eating those drugs? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought it was going to be a horrible show, but it was like, oh my God, they just got normal wisdom. They're smart. Okay. Now, depletion of glutathione. Glutathione is one of the most important protective materials that you got. Tylenol depletes it. Um, I don't know how, how accurate because uh, there's a lot of censorship on, on um, Google. Uh, you might want to look this up under some of the less censorable uh, search engines. But if you type in acetaminophen and glutathione, you're going to see some dangerous stuff. I mean, this stuff is poison. If you have it in your house, uh, don't even give it to a neighbor or somebody you don't like because that's bad karma. You know, but for sure, don't, don't give it to kids. But glutathione, look at this, garlic, onions, cruciferous vegetables, fantastically good for you. So when we talk about digestion, I wanted to get you a mechanical aspect. I, I didn't know how to, how to say digestion, a mechanical, you know, physiologic process that helps your brain that you can start taking charge of. That would be too long a title. <laughs> okay, so this has been healthy digestion. Okay, so, so that's why we put this up there realize that that we're going to go back we're going to go back to praying over your food because that food becomes you if you don't have a relationship with god or your creator okay realize this food becomes you if you put good energy in it you're going to get the good energy out okay if you don't believe in energy the food becomes you <laughs> no matter what it's still got to happen Okay, and if you're eating with a positive mental attitude, with some joy, with everything else, I mean, you're going to get the absorption. Proper nerve supply, exercise, proper nutrition. This is, hopefully you got a better idea of that. Because what's the best diet? Whatever your great-great-grandparents ate. Okay, sufficient rest and prayer and meditation. So we're, we're going to get into the, the dangerous information. And I mean dangerous now because they are arresting people for this. Okay, they, I just saw a, a couple of friends of mine that are, are, are vocal, okay, they're high up on the flagpole, and they've been assaulted by the FTC, okay, for having webinars about information that the government didn't approve of. So um, we're going to talk about what happens when the panic ends, okay, and notice I didn't say demic, just panic, okay. So those that are watching on YouTube and Facebook, God bless you guys, okay? Um, we're going to go into some real deep stuff now, and we'll be back next week with, uh, I think we're going to go over brain stuff, and brain stuff is really, really cool. You're going to find out how the brain regenerates neuroplasticity. That's going to be awesome.